righteousness. Imputed is a word which really means reckoned to or counted as. Therefore it was counted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was reckoned to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed or reckoned if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification or for our putting right. This is referring in the first instance to Abraham. If you had read the preceding chapters, you would see that Paul's argument is that Abraham had waited patiently for a long, long time to have a son. And he was getting old. And it seemed as though it wasn't going to happen. And that's still the case, of course, for some people who wait and wait and wait and it doesn't happen. They don't have a child. And uh, these days there's more that can be done about it, I suppose, than was the case in Abraham's day. But when he got up to around the 80, 90 mark uh, or so and uh, even closer to 100, it seemed as though and to him it was impossible. But he still believed that God was going to bless himself and Sarah with a son. We know that he, uh, he went off the track a little bit. And I don't think his faith failed. I think he uh, believed that maybe he wasn't doing what ought to be done. Maybe he should do what everyone else did in the community who didn't have a child. And that's take a maid, take a servant or take someone else to have a child in the place of his legal wife. And that would be counted as a legal son. But when God makes promises, he doesn't leave other people to carry out his responsibility and when God promised to uh, Abraham that he would have a son, he meant that he would have a son, a real son of his own, his and his legal wife. And so uh, Abraham waited patiently and uh, his wait for a son was rewarded. And eventually, unexpectedly perhaps, uh, for Sarah, but certainly not unexpectedly for Abraham, they had a son. And uh, his faith in the promise of God to give him a son was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now this alone didn't make Abraham a holy person. I'm not suggesting that at all, and this text doesn't suggest that either. But it suggests that God counted faith as righteousness. If one has faith in what God says and has absolute confidence in God, they can be counted as righteous. And uh, Paul doesn't just leave it with Abraham. He says, this applies to you also. This also applies to us. It's not just something that happened 1,800 or two, probably 1,200 1, years before uh, Paul wrote this. It is something that could happen in Paul's day, something that happens in our day, that if we have faith and believe in the promise of God, if we believe that what he tells us is so, it is counted to us for righteousness. What are we to believe? We are to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was raised for our justification. And that is, Jesus died to pay for our sins and he was raised again to demonstrate that the deal was done and that we are now right with God. That's what we are to have faith and confidence in. Faith is based on understanding and knowledge and information and confidence. If we don't have some information, we don't have anything to base any faith on. We don't have anything to look forward to. We don't have anything to work on. If we don't have some knowledge, we don't have anything to work on. But we have the knowledge. We have the knowledge that Jesus Christ did come and he did die and he did rise again and uh, that this was promised by God the Father, God our Creator, to be the thing that would deal with our sin problem. 
that Jesus' death would pay for the sins of every human being who has ever existed from Adam down to whoever the last child born in this world should be. We don't know where that would be. It would be interesting to know when the last child is to be born into the world. Is it going to be next year? Is it going to be in 10 years or 50 years' time? Um, we don't know. But there is a theory out there that because of the fact that the fertility rating in the world, across the world, is reducing quite fast, it could well be that in uh, 50 to 100 years' time there will be insufficient fertility to have children anymore. And uh, this, of course, is a great worry to, of all people, uh, people in China, where there's the, one of the densest populations in the world, but they're worried about this. And, uh, well, they might be worried. But uh, the last child is going to be born one day, and that child will also need the information and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as the saviour of the world. But then I want to go on a little bit into chapter 5. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You might have a Bible there that reads a little bit more simply than this uh, older style Bible does. But uh, it is saying, because we are justified by this faith, because we are put right, because we believe in Jesus, we actually believe it, not just say, yeah, I know all about that, but we actually believe it. And we say, yes, this works for me, then uh, we have peace. You know, there are three things that are essential in a, in a family setup. If a family setup is going to work well, there are three things that we have to have present there. And, uh, and you, can't see, uh, you can't see any of them. They are abstracts, but they are present and they are significant and they are important. One is faith. We've just dealt with that. There has to be faith. We have to keep faith. Parents have to keep faith with each other. Parents have to believe each other. Um, children have to believe their parents. Children have to have faith in their parents. They do, don't they? Who do they run to first off if they get a fright or something goes wrong? They run to a parent because they have faith in the parent. The next thing that has to be in the family is peace. If there's no peace in the family, the family can hardly be called a family. It can be called more likely a war zone. And uh, there are more wars being fought in the world than just in Afghanistan. There's more wars being fought in our homes today than there is anywhere else across the world. There's no peace in many, many homes. But a real home where there is real fellowship, there is peace. There's faith and there is peace. And uh, Jesus brings us peace. If we know that what Jesus has done has paid for our sins... If we know that we are freed from the penalty of sin, we know we are freed from the condemnation that comes to those who disobey God, we know that uh, it's all dealt with and it's all paid for, then we have peace of mind. We have peace. But this is a peace that is a peace that comes by a reconciliation, that we have an arrangement with God now where God can <coughs> treat us as sons and daughters and we treat God as our Father, and we can enjoy this as an enjoyment because things have been put right. There is a peace. The third thing I mentioned was the, uh, that there has to be is a fellowship. The first two set the foundation for a fellowship. <clears throat> Verse 2, chapter 5 says, By whom also we have access by faith, into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access, he says, and if we have access uh, to God, then we have come into a fellowship with him. This is an interesting word, this word access here. It's actually prosagoge, if you want to use the Greek word, prosagoge. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, word really means to bring us or to bring someone. Someone is bringing someone else. 
And uh, if you want to bring someone to someone else, nine times out of ten, it is because you are on good terms with the somebody else that you're bringing them to. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's your spouse or a child, and you say, I want to bring you to meet so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, you don't usually want to bring them to meet their enemies. You want to bring them so that they can enjoy something that this person uh, has uh, offered to yourself. And so uh, this word um, to have access by faith. By faith we are brought to God so that we're no longer frightened of him. So many people are frightened of God. So many people just uh, are scared to give themselves to God because they're scared of him. And uh, I suppose that's understandable because if they haven't known that their sins have been dealt with by Jesus on the cross, then they must think to themselves, I've got to deal with these sins myself. And their picture of God is one of a stern judge, a magistrate who only has a law book in front of him. And the law book tells you what the uh, law is. Uh, it, you are told how you have broken the law. And then there's another book that tells you what punishment you receive for having broken the law. So if you don't know that your sins are forgiven, and if you don't know that you are free and that you can have a good relationship with God, then of course you'll be afraid of God because you will know that uh, he is going to sit there perhaps or you will think he's going to sit there with his law book and his law book is going to condemn you. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience and patience, experience and experience, hope. And uh, in hope, we have not been let down. It says in my Bible, and hope maketh not ashamed, but it would read a little better. In hope, we are not let down. We hope, we look forward, we wish for, we expect and uh, we are in expectation of something good when we are introduced to God because of what Jesus has done. In fact, it's Jesus himself who introduces us to his Father. It's Jesus who says, come with me and I'll introduce you to my Father <coughs> because my Father is pleased with you because you have faith in me. You believe that I have done this. You believe that what your sins are paid for. I want you to come to my father so that my father can shake your hand and congratulate you upon your graduation from being a sinner to being a saint. He wants to be <coughs> uh, an act of prosagoge to take you and give you access to the father so that you can stand there and receive the approbation of God. I don't know what God's going to say when we all get to heaven. And I guess we're all going there, aren't we? That's where we want to be. I don't know what God is going to say. The only words that I know in the Bible that tells us what God says is, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. In other words, come and share the enjoyment that I have in seeing you accept by faith that Jesus Christ has dealt with your sins. Today, I trust that you can put aside any thoughts that God is displeased with you. I trust today that you can put aside any thoughts that Jesus' sacrifice was not good enough for your sins. I trust that you can put aside any thoughts that you can't ever get peace in this life. I trust you put aside any thoughts you might have that say, I can't enjoy fellowship with like believers and I can't enjoy a relationship with God. Because the Apostle Paul said, I was the chief of sinners and yet I enjoy all these things. The Apostle Paul was a slanderer. The Apostle Paul was a gossiper. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. The Apostle Paul 
was everything that is nasty. But then he realised that Jesus had paid for his sins as he died on the cross. And he realised that he could have peace with God now because God was not going to deal with his sins as he thought he was. God had dealt with his sins in his own son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> story is told of a great king of Oriental times who had a very large and important kingdom, significant kingdom. And he allowed or did not allow anybody to approach him unless he was introduced by his own personal servant. This was typical, of course, of, of Eastern uh, kingdoms and probably still applies today in some places. But someone wanted to see the king most urgently. But the rule was that if you approached the king without his most revered servant's introduction, you would immediately be escorted out by a guard and beheaded. This man wanted to see the king more than ever anyone had wanted to see the king. The story may or may not be true, but some of these stories have their parallels in the Bible because the story of Esther and Azazarus are somewhat similar. The man rushed in one day after waiting weeks and weeks for this introduction to see the king. He rushed into the outer yard of the palace outwitted the guards and uh, rushed up the steps and into the king's chamber and was about to deliver his little speech to the king and the guards came upon him from all angles. And as they were about uh, to drag him from the presence of the king, one of the guards pulling out his sword ready for the immediate execution, the king said, Stop, stop, stop right here. So the guards halted their operation and he said to the man, come and stand here beside me. So the man stood beside the king, trembling, of course, in fear, barely able to speak. And he said to him, why did you so badly want to come and see me? He said, I was given a vision. I was given a vision that you were going to die on your next trip. And I had to tell you. I was given a vision you were going to die on your next trip. I don't know where the trip was. The story doesn't say. And I was going to tell you. And you were going to die because evil men were going to lie in wait for you and they were going to shoot you with uh, bows and arrows as you passed a certain point. And he said, I had to tell you. And he said, why was it so important that you come uh, <coughs> uh, to me uh, like this? He said, I have my spies out there. And he says, I couldn't trust the story to anybody else. I couldn't trust it in case... One of your servants perhaps didn't like you and they twisted the story and you didn't get the message. I had to tell you myself. The king said, thank you very much. The guards jumped forward and grabbed the man again and led him out to execute him. But the king leapt off his throne and ran to the steps and shouted to the guards, leave him, leave him alone, leave him alone. From now on, he will become my number two trusted servant. And I wonder if that is somewhat of the illustration. We hold off. We hold off approaching the king because we don't really know his character and his nature. But uh, Jesus somehow touches our hearts and says, you can go to the king. You can go to the king. You can go to the king. 
We don't always have a message like that because we don't have to tell God the Father anything like that. But we need to bravely step out and do it because we can't trust our salvation to anybody else. We can't trust something so important to anybody else. We have to go and do it ourselves. We have to make that decision ourselves. I will go. And when we get there, we discover, <coughs> discover that the king is a man of tender heart. The reputations that come are not always right. And so if we <coughs> have faith, and believe what Jesus has told us, it will have peace in our hearts and we will enjoy a fellowship with someone whom we once perhaps were fearful of but we come to realise is one who is there for our good, one who is all heart. As Jesus took those disciples uh, <coughs> to the upper room, and washed their feet, they were a little fearful of him. He had surprised them at other times, but he was a little, they were a little fearful of him because he did something so unusual. He took a towel and he took off his uh, outer clothes and he, he got a basin and got the water, wherever that was, and, and uh, he went and started washing the disciples' feet and it made them afraid and Peter was probably more afraid than any of them because it... It really meant that he had to commit himself to Jesus in a way that he'd never really done before. And although he knew that Jesus was uh, such a holy being, he still had a kind of a, a fear of him. And the other disciples were also very timid about the whole thing because they didn't yet really understand him. But after the crucifixion, after Jesus had died the disciples understood. And any fear and, and timidity that they had of Jesus was dismissed like the, the fog in the morning and was gone and they boldly proclaimed him and they led people to Jesus and Jesus led people to his father. <clears throat> Today I want you to be reminded that although Jesus might seem a little intimidating to us sometimes, he wants to wash your feet. Not just the feet at the end of your shin bone, he wants to wash the feet of your mind, which sometimes wanders this way and wanders that way and that way and that way, wanders upwards and downwards. The steps of your mind take you in all kinds of places. And Jesus wants to wash those feet today. I know that you gave yourself to him a long time ago. Most of you would have done so. But along the pathway of life, our mind goes here and there and somewhere else. Our thoughts lead us to do things and to say things that shouldn't have been said and shouldn't have been done. And he wants to wash us again today. He wants to wash those mental feet. He wants also for you to show that you have fellowship with him by drinking that little bit of grape juice, the wine that represents your confidence in him as our saviour. He wants you to fellowship with him by eating the bread that represents you have confidence in his resurrection, in the reality of his resurrection where he has a body. The bread represents his body, the reality of a living Jesus who lives there and is effective in your life just as much today as he was in the life of the apostles. So as we separate, as we separate now for the foot washing ceremony, I trust that you will confidently take Jesus with you and you will confidently wash one another's feet. You will confidently come and enjoy the fellowship, not just with our group here today, but the fellowship with Jesus, knowing without the least fear that he is indeed your saviour. Let's uh, just bow our heads in prayer. We'll go out for foot washing immediately after. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have promised us that we can be reconciled to you, that we have need of no fear, that our sins have been dealt with on the cross. And uh, today we recognise that uh, 
uh, we have become uh, dusted and soiled in the course of time and uh, that we need to have a refreshing. We need the water of cleansing in our spirit. We pray that uh, there are heads bowed here today that uh, you will accept us and that uh, we will each one confess to you our shortcomings, our failings, not necessarily in every little detail, but in principle, seeking forgiveness for all that we have done that is wrong, and uh, again claiming the assurance of salvation that we have in you. So dismiss us to the foot washing service with this blessing, this assurance, and this uh, cleansing we ask, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Invite the ladies to go to the uh, uh, boardroom, uh, which is down the uh, corridor there and on the left, and the men will go down to the hall at the end of the corridor for the foot washing service. Thank you. working now it is working now we have before us on the table the uh, the bread and the wine the bread being just little token pieces of bread but little tokens can be important and uh, the wine is uh, just pure grape juice which correctly represents the purity of Jesus because there was no ferment or degeneration in him whatever so we take a pure grape juice and we take the sample of bread the grape juice representing the pure life of Jesus, which was uh, sacrificed for us, <clears throat> and the bread represents his body because Jesus was as real as you and I are. So we never want to think that Jesus was something artificial or he was some figment of the imagination, as some people had tried to do over the years. We want to see Jesus as someone real who really did die. He really did rise again. He really is in heaven he really is our advocate, one who stands introducing us to his Father on a regular basis. And so we want to show today that we have confidence in Jesus as our Saviour, that we still maintain that confidence. Maybe it's three or four months since we partook in this kind of service, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, we want to show again that we really still have confidence in Jesus as the Saviour and in the Father's love and concern for us. So we're going to uh, dedicate these uh, uh, emblems here. We're going to ask uh, um, um, Brother Horman if he will ask the blessing on the bread, and uh, then we'll ask Brother Dave Melville if he'll ask the blessing on the wine. We invite you to bow your heads in prayer as we kneel. Dearest Heavenly Father, we bow in remembrance of that great sacrifice that you paid for each and every one of us, Lord. And your body was put under so much pressure and your suffering started right there as you walked to the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, the thought of you being separated from your Father was practically more than you could bear. And Father, that is our prayer too, that we will never be separated from Jesus. Lord, help us to be close to him. Help us to realise, Lord, that without him... We are nothing. And, Father, it is a joy and a privilege to uh, have a relationship with Jesus, Lord, because we know the closer we come to him, the more we'll love what he loves, Lord, and we'll know that uh, as the day comes for when he prepares to take us home, that we will know him as he knows us. Father, be with us now as we partic participate in this emblem of his body. In Jesus' name. At Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Cal
Calvary, Calvary, burdens the lifted at Calvary. Jesus broke the bread and he handed a piece to each of his disciples or alternatively they uh, took the loaf of bread that was used for the uh, Passover service and they, they each broke a piece off and uh, that little piece of bread became an emblem of Jesus. It must have made us impression because the early Christians met frequently to participate in this ordinance service. And we are part of a great Christian tradition as we do so again today. But when I use the word tradition, I'm not, not meaning something that was just handed down because it was done. It is something that comes down to us because Jesus set in place a memorial service that is more meaningful than any other for reminding us of the death and uh, the life of Jesus. And so we invite you all to partake. Uh, of this emblem and uh, contemplate what Jesus means to you. We'd ask you now to kneel as we bless the wine. Our Father in heaven, this morning as we bow our heads before you, Lord, I would ask that each one of us here would take what we're doing now as very personal. Lord, this is a very personal occasion as we recommit our lives to you again, Lord, as we set right the things we've done wrong, as we reacquaint, reacquaint ourselves with people we may not be getting on with. Lord, there are many bowed before you this morning from children and school children through to those people perhaps near at the end of their lives, dear Father, and each one of us has a need for you this morning. Each one of us needs to feel once again reunited with you. By your blood, Lord, this is possible. By your sacrifice and by your death. Lord, as the pastor has spoken, it is not just tradition this morning. This is personal. Lord, may we accept what you have done for us, what you have given for us, Lord, in our lives. There will be times that we need you, that we need you badly, Father, in grief or sickness or sadness. Father, we ask that we will be in touch with you every day, Lord, that we will not let you go and that you will not let us stray. For the, Father, send your Holy Spirit to prompt us and to never let us walk too far from you. Help us to recognize our need for us and thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice for us every day. These things we ask in your name. Amen.
Jesus handed the uh, cup with the grape juice to his disciples and in doing so he was, had now established uh, a new order of things. The old Passover service would never be required again. A new service that more fitly and correctly represented the status of humanity uh, was now to continue. And he invited his disciples to all partake of it so that they could all in symbol and uh, be a part uh, of his new order of things. And so we invite you all to partake of it today also to indicate your faith and confidence in Jesus and that you too are part of that new order where we now become secure in his kingdom if by faith we maintain our relationship with him. So please take it and drink the special emblem of Jesus' shed blood. Scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that uh, they sung a hymn afterwards. The hymn was a psalm. We're not too sure what psalm it was that they sung, but uh, I guess it was a psalm that had to do with uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of God, with Jesus uh, Christ as its uh, as its King. But we're going to sing together to close our service uh, face to face with Christ, my Saviour. Yeah, the number is two hundred six. If you're using the hymnal. I invite you to stand as we conclude the service with this hymn. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? When with 
rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face shall I behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him. darkening bell between, but the blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. Face to face shall I behold him far beyond the starry sky. Father, we pray now that you will dismiss us with that blessing of assurance that we have salvation because we have faith and confidence in your gift to us, the gift of paying the penalty of our sins and accepting us into the fellowship of yourself and of your Father. Dismiss us with this assurance, we pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>